Is slavery draped in the cloak of religion or hidden behind the mask of a color? In a forgotten chapter of history, it turns out it's neither. Amidst the vast expanse of Earth's oceans rests the majestic Mediterranean Sea. Its tranquil blue waters glisten under the golden sun, creating a symphony with their ebbs and flows. Beneath this scene of tranquility lies a tumultuous past that cast a dark shadow over 200 years of human history. Nestled between three continents, the sea has long served as a busy highway for seafaring vessels. Yet, this prosperous merging of trade routes didn't always forge harmony. More often, it sparked greed and power, the true rulers of the shores. Despite the bustling trade, a side of the Mediterranean coast harbored a peril for seafarers, more treacherous than any storm or shipwreck. This menace could shatter a person's life, propelling them into a dark web of misery. That threat was none other than the Corsairs of the Barbary Coast. In this video, I've delved deep into the forgotten chapters of the Barbary slave trade. This journey has been eye-opening revealing a saga of fear, courage, and resilience, reshaping our view of the Mediterranean world. Have you ever wondered what the most lucrative commodity was in the ships sailing the Mediterranean Sea between the 16th and 19th centuries? I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Stay with me as we uncover the untold stories of European captives, the power struggles of North African Corsairs, and the relentless efforts of European nations to reclaim their seas. What drove the early lords of the sea? Was it wealth, power, or religious zeal? Our story begins long before the golden age of piracy, before the arrival of Blackbeard and Calico by pirates of very different origins. Piracy had ancient roots in North Africa, Yet, it wasn't until the 16th century, with the backing of powerful rulers, that piracy gained significant political clout. Slave markets have been present in the North African coastal areas since Roman times, but they started flourishing in the 15th century, especially on the Barbary Coast. But why was it called Barbary? Understanding the background of the Barbary Coast sheds light on this question. The name Barbary itself stems from Berber, the indigenous non-Arab tribes renowned for their prowess in combat. They were great warriors and raiders on the land. They decided to take on the sea too and became a force to be reckoned with within the maritime landscape by the 15th century. Their ascent can be accredited to the arrival of the Ottoman Empire in the region. This rise in piracy didn't just symbolize a shift in power dynamics in the Mediterranean. It also left a profound economic impact on European trade. Coastal villages from Sicily to Spain lived in fear, their economies disrupted by the constant threat of raids and abductions. In a symbolic relationship, the empire protected the Corsairs, who in return provided revenues and fulfilled certain duties, solidifying their position in the Mediterranean. Moreover, the influx of Sephardi Jews and Muslims, expelled from Spain after the Reconquista, further fueled their ascent in piracy. The Barbary Coast, a melting pot of expelled Sephardi Jews, Muslims, and indigenous Berbers, became a cradle of cultural and technological exchange, weaving a rich tapestry unlike any other. These interactions, though born out of conflict, sometimes led to unexpected exchanges of knowledge and techniques between the Corsairs and their captives. From 1580, to 1680, the Barbary Coast became home to 15,000 renegades, including Christian Europeans who had converted to Islam. What's more, half of the Corsair captains were renegades. Some of them had come to North Africa looking for better opportunities, and they found them in the restless seas. The destitute immigrants from Spain also found an opportunity in piracy that could propel them in status and ranks. Though the lure of immense riches was a primary motivator, it wasn't the only force driving the surge in piracy. Sometimes, people were commissioned into piracy, as was the case of the famous Barbarossa brother, Baruch. Following an incident, he was captured by the Knights of St. John, a Catholic military order based on Rhodes Island, and imprisoned for three years. However, he managed to escape incarceration. 
after which an Ottoman prince in Antalya commissioned him to take on the knights. He was provided with 18 galleys as a part of the deal. Bitter from his imprisonment, he abandoned his mission and alongside his brother, Hayredin, became the most notorious Barbary Corsair. These brothers weren't just skilled marauders, they also masterfully safeguarded the North African ports from Spanish incursions. The notoriety of Corsairs like Oruk Barbosa didn't go unnoticed. European powers rattled by the threat to their trade and citizens began devising strategies and forming alliances setting the stage for a long, drawn-out battle against piracy on the high seas. Some Corsairs were disgruntled privateers who had been decommissioned by European governments for various reasons. One such renegade was John Ward, a privateer from Kent commissioned by Elizabeth I to plunder Spanish ships after the failed invasion. He continued his plundering activities after the war with Spain ended, operating without a valid commission, which turned him from a privateer into a pirate. Ward landed in Tunis after stealing a ship from Portsmouth, where he received permission from Uthman Day, the most powerful military commander, to raid and seize European ships in the Mediterranean. Ward became another notorious figure in Barbary piracy, though he was not admired by the English. The English ambassador to Venice described Ward as the greatest scoundrel that ever sailed from England. Ward's allies included another notorious figure, a Dutchman named Simon Danziger, who converted to Islam and became known as Deli Reese. His ferocity earned him the nickname Crazy Captain. Initially, the Barbary Corsairs were the maritime vanguard of the Ottoman Empire. They were an integral part of the Ottoman fleet and conducted independent raiding of Christian shipping and territory as well. During that time, piracy became a lucrative option for the residents of the Barbary Coast. The coastline got a reputation for it. The Barbary Corsairs didn't just dominate the seas, they also pillaged the adjacent lands, casting a long shadow of fear along the coastlines and beyond. While the Mediterranean Sea remained a crucial route for the international trade, carrying shipments of spices, gold, gems, and other valuables from the Middle East and India, alongside food items and raw materials from Europe, it also became a target for marauders. Among the sought-after goods, the most valuable were humans. The slave trade was a lucrative business during this time, enabling many to amass generational wealth through this heinous practice. Marauders would plunder ships and towns, seizing valuables including people whom they enslaved for ransom or sold in slave markets. In these markets, various fates awaited the unfortunate souls. As for men, some were sold to the state and forced into construction work, while others were consigned to the galleys. Women were often purchased for labor or placed in harems. However, the most dreadful fate awaited those sent to the galleys, where they faced harsh conditions detailed later in the video. By the 17th century, the Corsairs operated under the Ottoman Empire's authority. However, this changed in the early 17th century due to a revolt that diminished the influence of the ruling Ottoman Pashas in towns like Tripoli, Algiers, Tunis, and others. This marked the peak of Barbary Corsairs' power. With full government support, they became semi-autonomous entities driven by abundant revenues and an influx of slaves. Alan Jameson, in his book Lords of the Sea, asserts that this period represented the height of the Corsairs' power. They expanded beyond the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, venturing as far as Ireland, Iceland, and England. The motivations of the Barbary Corsairs were multifaceted. While the pursuit of wealth was the primary driver, their actions were also shaped by complex geopolitical shifts and the changing preferences of the patrons. However, amidst their ambitions and aspirations, the question arises, who were the victims of these marauders? Imagine setting sail for a voyage across the sea, only to be abruptly seized and carried off to an unknown land, losing sight of home and hope. Who were the unfortunate souls that faced this risk and what became of them after falling into the hands of the Corsairs? The Barbary of the Corsairs were notorious for seizing ships and raiding coastal settlements to supply the thriving Barbary slave markets. Their targets often included the European shoreline along the Mediterranean, stretching from Venice to Spain. The impact of their raids was so severe 
that the island of Gozo in Malta was completely depopulated by these pirates. Such was the pervasive threat that coastal inhabitants living in perpetual fear were compelled to abandon their homes and move inland, their lives upended by the constant shadow of captivity. At one point, the fishermen refused to continue fishing for fear of either their families being captured at land or themselves while they were at sea. In the 17th century, the Corsairs expanded their reach to the Atlantic, reaching the shores of England and Ireland. This period is marked by a striking irony and a complex intertwining of histories. While British slave ships were transporting black African slaves across the Atlantic in one horrific trade, Arab pirates in a separate but equally grim commerce were bringing English white slaves to Africa, challenging our notions of race and enslavement. This raises questions about whether race or religion was a decisive factor in enslavement. The Barbary pirates continuously attacked English merchant and fishing vessels for two centuries, demonstrating their strength through the staggering numbers of ships they seized. In 1666, the Admiralty reported 446 seized vessels and their crews in the past seven years. The mayor of Poole in Dorset reported that 27 ships and 200 sailors had been captured off the coast in just 10 days. In 1625, 2,000 wives of captured sailors petitioned Parliament to pay ransom for their husbands' return. These staggering numbers paint a grim picture, not just of the immense threat posed by these pirates, but also of the profound impact on countless lives and communities torn apart by fear and loss. The havoc they wreaked on the Southwest Peninsula, where deserted vessels floating on the sea became a common sight, further underscores the magnitude of their impact. In August 1625, Barbary Corsairs launched a devastating attack on the local settlements at St. Michael's Bay in Cornwall, capturing 60 men, women, and children and enslaving them. Shortly after, they raided the port of Lou, where the townsfolk had already fled to the surrounding fields in anticipation of the threat. Despite this, the pirates managed to capture 80 people, mostly sailors. Their audacity knew no bounds, as they even seized Lundy Island, and used it as a base for seven years. It's remarkable considering Lundy Island is visible from the north coast of Devon, highlighting the pirates' perceived invincibility and the British Empire's helplessness. With Lundy serving as a strategic base, the Corsair's reach extended even to the distant shores of Iceland, where in 1647, they launched a raid and captured over 400 people, a testament to their far-reaching influence and the audacity. De Lloris utilized the same island to conquer the Baltimore Channel in Cork County, where they abducted 103 villagers from the Irish settlement, with only three returning from slavery. The fate of those who did not return and whether they could reintegrate into their previous lives remains unknown. Estimates suggest that from 1622 to 1644, Around 7,000 English sailors and others were taken captive. Despite protests from petitions by English subjects urging their rulers to protect them, the threat of Barbary pirates continued to escalate. The Civil War during the 1640s further exacerbated the situation, providing the pirates with an opportunity to plunder the British coast. At one point, there were 60 ships held by the Barbary pirates operating from the southwest coast alone. Before delving into the miserable lives led by Barbary slaves, it's crucial to clarify a common misconception surrounding their captivity. The narrative surrounding the Barbary slaves is often oversimplified to a tale of Muslims capturing white Christians, seemingly driven by religious animosity. Yet the truth is far more nuanced and complex. While religion may have played a role, it would be overly simplistic to attribute this issue solely to the religious differences. According to many historians, including Robert Davis, author of Christian Slaves, Muslim Masters, White Slavery in the Mediterranean Sea, the Barbary Coast, and Italy, the Corsairs were not concerned with the race or religion of their captives. Slaves captured by the Barbary Corsairs came from diverse backgrounds, including various races and religious affiliations. They could be Black, Brown, Catholic, White, Orthodox, Protestant, Jewish, or even Muslim. Similarly, the Corsairs themselves were not exclusively Muslim. English privateers and Dutch captains were also involved in these raids, 
often commissioned by their respective states. This complexity arose from the rapidly changing geopolitical landscape of the time, where alliances shifted frequently and friends could become enemies with a mere stroke of a pen. In such a volatile environment, individuals and states alike sought to leverage, changing loyalties for their own benefit. As for the English, white slaves taken by the Barbary pirates, historian Robert Davies estimates that the Barbary Corsairs captured up to 1.2 million captives from Europe over a 200-year period. While some academics question the validity of this figure, no alternative estimate has been proposed thus far. Given the high numbers of enslaved people, one might wonder about the fate that awaited these captives. As mentioned earlier, those who could arrange ransoms were kept as captives, while the others were sold into bustling slave markets. A certain percentage of slaves were kept by rulers for their own use, while the remainder were engaged in various forms of labor. Among the cruelest forms of slave labor was toiling in the galleys, where slaves were condemned to row chained to their oars, enduring grueling conditions often until their last breath. Persistent rowing led to friction with the skin, resulting in sores, cuts, infections, and diseases. Their meager diet consisted of fish remnants and decaying vegetables. Moreover, they faced frequent whipping by their masters for any perceived slowness or mistakes. The fact that people weren't safe even while performing essential tasks speaks volumes about the grave insecurity they faced. Reverend Devereaux Spratt's story is just one of many illustrating this insecurity. Captured in 1641 after a simple voyage across the Irish Sea from Cork County to England, he was enslaved in Algiers for several years. His story is just one of many forgotten tales of individuals who suffered similar fates. Spratt recounts his tragedy as, When we had arrived in court, I made a request to Lord Inchicoan to give me a passport for England. I took a boat to Yoel and then embarked on the vessel John Filner, which set sail with 120 passengers. But before we had lost sight of land, we were captured by Algerine pirates who put all the men in irons. As for the experience of being a slave, even those who didn't work in the galleys didn't have it any better. Renowned English diarist Samuel Pepe's entry from February 8, 1661 featured Barbary slaves. It states, went to the Fleece Tavern to drink, and there we spent till four o'clock telling stories of Algiers and the manner of the life of slaves there. And truly Captain Motham and Mr. Dawes, who have been both slaves there, did make me fully acquainted with their condition there, as how they eat nothing but bread and water, how they are beat upon the soles of their feet and bellies at the liberty of their patron, how they are all at night called into their master's bagnard, and there they lie, how the poorest men do use their slaves the best, how some rogues do live well, if they do invent to bring their masters in so much a week by their industry or theft, and then they are put to no other work at all, and theft there is counted no great crime at all. The casual discussion of such treatment highlights its prevalence during that time. However, while captives toiled in North Africa, how did Europe respond to this relentless threat? As their citizens were captured daily, European nations were faced with an urgent dilemma, how to effectively tackle the fearsome corsairs and safeguard their people. Initially, European nations aimed to secure the release of their captives by arranging ransom payments, engaging in intricate and often fraught negotiations to bring their people home. The clergy played a significant role in these efforts, although they were somewhat selective in their approach. They prioritized ransoming Christians, particularly men, as women were often viewed as harlots once they entered harems. Despite their efforts, not all captives could be released due to insufficient funds and high number of captives. Confronted with the pervasive threat and substantial losses, France and Spain resorted to striking tribute treaties with the Barbary states, seeking to ensure the safe passages of their ships. However, some states stood firm, refusing to participate in what they saw was a protection racket, asserting their sovereignty and dignity. As a result, sailors from these states remained vulnerable to capture. Among those affected were American sailors, whose colonies had begun war with Britain. France, their ally during the war, had included their ships and sailors in their tribute treaty with the Barbary states. However, gaining independence, the United States was no longer protected by this alliance. 
Consequently, 130 American sailors were seized in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, a significant blow to the newly formed nation. In a diplomatic attempt to resolve this crisis, Thomas Jefferson and John Smith engaged in tense negotiations with an envoy from Algiers and London, aiming to secure the release of their fellow citizens. Jefferson questioned the grounds on which they were enslaving American citizens. The envoy cited the Holy Quran claiming a duty to plunder and enslave sinners, non-believers or non-Muslims, as justification. While such practices deviated from Islam's teachings, the Corsairs utilized religion to rationalize their acts of slavery. In 1794, the Americans reluctantly paid a tribute of $800,000 for the release of their sailors held captive by the Barbary Corsairs. However, Thomas Jefferson, staunchly opposed to this course of action, adopted a markedly different strategy upon assuming the presidency in 1801. He canceled the tributes altogether, infuriating Tripoli's rulers who then declared war on the United States. This stance led to the outbreak of the First Barbary War, a grueling four-year conflict that saw the U.S. and Sweden unite against the formidable forces of Tripoli. The war marked a crucial test for the fledgling U.S. Marines and Navy showcasing their valor and strategic acumen through a series of significant and hard-fought engagements. Notably, it was during this conflict that the U.S. Marines raised the American flag on foreign soil for the first time, a moment immortalized in the U.S. Marine hymn. Ultimately, the battle compelled Tripoli's ruler to negotiate, leading to the release of the captives of war. Following a decade of relative peace, the Barbary Corsairs resumed their attacks in 1815, targeting American vessels and those of other states that refused to pay tribute. The United States once again intervened, this time engaging in a war against Algiers. However, the outcome was less eventful, as the U.S. had already established its presence on the world stage. Algiers eventually conceded to the U.S. demands and paid $10,000 in compensation for the American ship seized by the pirates. Meanwhile, the British, having abolished slavery in 1807, were keen to extend this moral stance to other states, urging them to follow suit in eradicating the slave trade. Clearly persuading the Barbary states demanded not only diplomatic finesse, but also an unmistakable resolve, a testament to the intricate balance of power and negotiation. Besides, with the end of the Napoleon Wars, they had turned their attention to the Mediterranean, where the Barbary Corsairs posed a threat to their geostrategic interests. The issue of the Barbary states loomed large, an undeniable challenge that required decisive action and strategic diplomacy. In 1816, the British Empire sent a diplomatic mission to North Africa to persuade the states to cease their practice of slavery or at least refrain from targeting British ships. While Tunis and Tripoli agreed to the terms, Algiers showed less enthusiasm. In response, the day of Algiers massacred 200 Mediterranean Christians who were supposedly under British protection. Provoked by this egregious act of aggression, the British alongside the Dutch launched a formidable and decisive bombardment on Algiers, marking a critical turning point in the long-standing conflict and reshaping the power dynamics in the region. The battle was catastrophic, resulting in thousands of casualties on both sides, but particularly high losses for Algiers. The defeat of Algiers ultimately led to a treaty in which 3,000 European slaves were released. The growing waves of resistance were fierce and resolute, but were they strong enough to silence the Corsairs' cannons? Was it solely the relentless salvo of cannons, or did the shifting winds in geopolitical and geoeconomic landscapes also play a pivotal role in bringing an end to the notorious Barbary slave trade? Multiple defeats dealt significant blows to the Barbary Corsairs, leading to a decline in their markets. However, the trade and pillaging activities of the Corsairs continued, albeit with less momentum. By this time, European natives, with the British Navy at the forefront, had significantly bolstered their might, emerging as a formidable deterrent against the Corsairs' activities. During this period, Algeria stood out as a primary hub of enslavement and slave trade. Yet, the French conquest of the territory in 1830 marked a turning point, effectively closing this dark chapter in history. Additionally, the Kingdom of Morocco had proactively taken steps to suppress piracy, 
contributing to the overall decline of the Corsair threat. It was not merely the force of arms, but a multifaceted onslaught involving bombardments, looming threats, decisive conquests, and mounting international pressure that collectively ushered in the decline of the Barbary threat. This complex interplay of factors marked the end of an era defined by maritime predation and human suffering. While the cannons eventually fell silent, the echoes of this tumultuous, dark era resonate through time, inviting us to reflect on its lasting impact and the lessons it imparts. Within the vast tapestry of history, why should we direct our gaze toward the tale of the Barbary slave trade? What makes this chapter so compelling and necessary to understand? These chapters expose the dark truths about human nature, revealing our capacities for both cruelty and endurance. The Barbary slave trade stands as one of these profound truths, a testament to the complexities and contradictions inherent in the human experience. Reflecting on the legacy of the Barbary slave trade is not merely an exercise in historical recollection. It is a crucial reckoning with the complexities of our shared past and the enduring impact it continues to have on our world today. The echoes of this dark chapter reverberate through time, manifesting in the persistent inequalities and injustices that continue to challenge our societies today. To remember the Barbary slave trade is to confront uncomfortable truths about the depths of human depravity and the enduring legacy of oppression. This history challenges us not only to acknowledge the systemic injustices that have woven their way through the fabric of our world, but also to actively commit ourselves to unraveling these threads, building a future firmly rooted in the principles of equality, justice, and compassion. As the Mediterranean waves continue to whisper these tales of the past, let them serve as a solemn reminder to listen, learn, and deeply reflect. What lessons from the Barbary slave trade do you feel resonate most strongly today, and how should they inform our path forward? I invite you to share your thoughts.